nine. So it was about two and a half hours from Monroeville, where Harper Lee was born and raised. She had some family in Alexander City. And when she heard about this crazy story, this voodoo preacher, the reverend was alleged to have been a voodoo priest. And that's how he was getting away with these murders. And he was making all this money because he held insurance policies on the victims. And then he was gunned down at the funeral. And the lawyer who had defended him was defending the vigilante. And she heard all these stories and decided to go to Alexander City to look into it. And the truth is, people talk just as much about the reverend today as they did in 1977 when he was gunned down. I would go around and do these interviews and people would tell me where I shouldn't drive at night and how I shouldn't go to his grave at night because he's still haunted. He has living family members in the region. The vigilante is still alive. The lawyer who defended them both has passed away, but he has a big extended family in the area. So it's the story of the clutter murders that Capote tried to write about. These crimes, when they happen in small towns, really are indelible and they shape the geography and they become part of the story of the place. The story of the Reverend Maxwell is still very prominent in Alexander City. I think it's amazing that he does have family member left because it sounds like he was picking them off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, it's one of these things one wants to be respected is a true story. It's not made up. Real people did die and there are survivors who remain. And so you don't want to joke too much. But of course, yes, everyone I interviewed there, including people who knew him or who had lost family members, eventually succumbed to this kind of macabre humor because, in fact, there was this letter that one of the insurance companies submitted to the court. They were terminating a bunch of policies with the reverend and Harper Lee joked it was a hit list. It was two dozen other relatives he had insurance insurance policies on who presumably could have been targeted at any moment that he needed money. That included an infant daughter. There was just a tremendous amount of fear at the time. At first, it seemed like a coincidence or that the reverend had been framed because the first victim was his first wife. But when he lost a second wife under nearly identical circumstances and collected just as much insurance money on her, it seemed less like a coincidence. But people really did worry and wonder about who all he had insurance on and who might be next because it was five murders in a seven-year period. She worked tirelessly on the reverend. Why do you think it never saw the light of day? That is the real mystery of my book. The book starts out in the courtroom at the vigilante's trial. It was one of these truly just famous trials. People filled the courtroom and they waited outside to hear gossip about testimony and then they waited for the verdict. There was so much mystery about what would happen. Would the vigilante be convicted? Would he get off? Instantly, the moment that mystery was solved, the mystery became, when was Harper Lee going to publish the book? And then when she didn't, why didn't she? A lot of people have a lot of different theories, and I have to posit the possibility. Some of them insist that she wrote it and it just hasn't been published. Some of them think she never wrote it. It was a tremendously difficult period of her life, and she was struggling with depression and her alcoholism and her perfectionism, and there are all sorts of reasons why she wouldn't have been able to finish it. But plenty of people who knew her, who she she read portions to where they heard about portions she had read to other family members insist it's only a matter of time before the manuscript is found, <laughs> which is a tantalizing possibility. That's basically what happened with Ghosts at a Watchman. So I think for me, it's like, depends on the day you ask me, do I think she wrote it or not? <laughs> I spent two years kind of afraid that she had and that it would be published and then no one would read my book. You see that version of this case if there were the Harper Lee version. <laughs> I mentioned she's a big character in the book, so then I kind of made my peace with even if her version were to come out, she would never have written about herself because she was so private. So there would still be room for this kind of meta version of things, which was the crime story and her attempt to write about it. I think it's a great question. Why didn't it see the light of day? But I'm also just chastened by the fact that people who knew her really well insist that she wrote the whole thing and didn't publish it. And so then the question is, is it amongst her things and the estate will soon be putting it out? I think that that estate is still sealed. So it really is possible that it's there or that there are at least no like the kind she made for Capote out in Kansas that could be published as her reporting notes. She had a tape recorder at the time. So one of my prayers is that the tapes turn up because she was investigating this at the time it happened. So she interviewed a lot of people I couldn't. I mentioned the Reverend was accused of killing two wives. It's impossible to believe, but a third woman married him. (laughs) And that third wife was alive 
when Harper Lee was investigating. And so Harper Lee interviewed the third wife. I don't want to spoil anything, but it turns out there's a very straightforward reason why she might have married him and why she would have survived him. I don't want to be too oblique, but it was a brave thing for Harper Lee to go and talk to her. And I really do just wish to hear those tapes. Well, Casey, you are obviously a very good researcher and you spend a lot of time making sure you've got the whole story. Do you have another story you're working on? any more books? Well, that is very flattering. And I'll tell you, this was a humbling first book to write because at some point, very wonderfully, people who loved me reminded me that I couldn't spend the rest of my life researching it. And that at the end of the day, there are some things we may never know. (laughs) We may never know why the reverend decided to commit these crimes or why he decided to persist in doing them. Even though I've spent years now thinking about Harper Lee, there are things about her I may never know. And so I think for me, it was humbling to realize no amount of research necessarily will give us absolute clarity and certainty, which is all to say that I think the next book is actually, I thought like it was hard to research the 1970s, but I think the next book is actually going to be about the 17th century and a shipwreck. And I wouldn't have written it if I hadn't started with this one, because I figure, hey, if the 1970s are possible to reconstruct, why not just go back in time even further? If we can accept that we may never know for sure what's stopping me. And it's a shipwreck story that kind of like Furious Hours, I think has a couple of different parts. And it's a ship that wrecked in the 17th century, but then was found in the 20th century. And there was a tremendous legal battle over who owned the treasure because it was a Spanish treasure galleon. So I think it'll be kind of like Furious Hours. There'll be some religious history. There'll be some legal history. There'll be some interesting archaeology. And so I'm really excited, but it does mean kind of going even further back in time. Do you know when this will be out or you're just starting your research? Yeah, I'm just starting. I started the day that Furious Hours was published because I'm one of these people who procrastinates with work. I'm always cheating on one story with another story. So I started researching it last year and I've been reading and looking around and trying to get documents and things. But my day job is I'm a staff writer at The New Yorker. So I have a lot of shorter pieces that I've been working on and profiles and reviews and things that keep me busy. I think it'll be a couple years before it's out, which I think is a healthy thing for a book. It's interesting with Furious Hours, researching someone as private as Harper Lee. There were people who I asked to interview the first year I was working on it who said no. And then they said no the second year. And then year three, finally, they said, okay, fine, you've persisted, or so-and-so you interviewed told me you're all right, so we'll have a conversation. I think those long gestation periods are good for books because it allows, first of all, sources to change their mind, but also time for documents to turn up that people told you didn't exist, just for more information to emerge. So I think with a book, it has to be a kind of slow burn. So this one will take me a little while, but it will not take me as long as it took Harper Lee, I can tell you that. (laughs) Well, I don't think you'll have to worry about your sources coming to light for a book in the 1700s. Yeah, the, yeah fair enough, right? I'll, I'll be having my seances, which I'll tell you, my God, at some point I did think like I should have a seance with the reverend. Would he finally tell me everything? No, it's the court battle in the 20th century. And there are some earlier researchers into it who I'd love to have talk. But fair enough, I'm not waiting on the ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> well, definitely keep us posted when that comes out because it sounds fascinating. Yeah, well, thanks so much for talking to me about the book. It's always a pleasure. I think for writers. It's wonderful that anyone reads your book, but it's wonderful when you get to have a long and patient conversation about it, because of course you're right. You research these things for such a long time. It's so rewarding to get to have more than a kind of soundbite conversation about it. Can you give us your website so that people can find you in your books? I always hate it during these political debates where people are like spelling out their names and then adding a .com, but that's exactly what it is. It's caseysep.com. The truth is, if you're interested in the book, any local bookstore will have it. I actually really love to try and support the brick and mortar stores because those are the ones who bring authors around the country. And so if you can buy it from your local store and if you call them up and say my name or the Harper Lee book or Furious Hours, they'll order it for you and get it for you right away during quarantine. And then more often I'm writing for the New Yorker. If you go to the New Yorker site, it'll have kind of everything I'm working on and everything that's come out. Oh, I'm so glad you said about the brick and mortar because we're huge advocates for that. We're going to make sure that our local bookstore has your book. Oh, great. It's very sweet to me. I'll tell you, you mentioned research. This will not turn into a sermon, although I am interested in religion. It's why I found 
the Reverend Maxwell is such a fascinating character to write about, but I'll evangelize for just a minute. And it's like libraries and bookstores, they always know more than the algorithm does. There's a little riff in my book about the history of life insurance. And I swear to God, I thought I had read everything there was to read about life insurance and the history and the difference of experience for various races, because it was extremely predatory for African Americans. Anyway, I'd read all these financial histories and everything. And the other day I was talking to a bookseller from Scuppernong Books in South Carolina. And out of nowhere, he said to me, well, have you ever read Alan Gerganis's Blessed Assurance? And I said, I, I know Alan Gerganis, but what's that? He said, oh, it's a novella. It's about an insurance salesman. He's white and he's selling to black clients. For all of my research, all of my Googling, all of my searching, I'd never come across it. I'm just excited to read it. And I think the algorithm just will never be able to do what a good bookseller or a good librarian will do. And so I think especially during this time where it's so hard for them, it's so much easier for people to go online and buy from a big box store or just their favorite website. It's just such a tremendously important time to try and support these real experts and the people who are in our communities and who do this work. It's such an important time to be buying from them and spending our money locally. We couldn't agree more. Sermon over. Thank you. (laughs) Well, Casey, we thank you so much for talking with us today. We loved your book. We're looking forward to reading about 17th century (laughs) shipwrecks. Uh, (laughs) So get to work. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks, Casey. Bye-bye. Well, I think this book definitely shows you that truth is stranger than fiction. Some of the things that went on in the South, of course, these are not in today's day and age. There were things that Willie got away with that he would never have gotten away with in today's day and age. I don't know. That one autopsy could not find any reason for, I think it was his brother's death. Mm-hmm. There was the toxicology no didn't death. show anything. It was very odd. And I'm really curious about how he did it. And of yeah. course, we'll never know. Yeah, we'll definitely never know. I have this feeling, of course, you know, I'm no expert in it, but do direct results of what Willie was able to achieve, that I'm sure there's all kinds of insurance reform. Probably a direct result of what he was able to take advantage of, try to get these and payouts for these insurance companies. That might have been a good question to ask Casey. You know, it's funny you think of things after the interview. But the book was very well written. It really was an interesting read. Some of these books can be very dry when they go back into old cases. This was not the case in this book. I almost felt this book could have been two or maybe even possibly three books. The story of Reverend Willie Maxwell, it left me wanting to know more detail about it. She could have definitely expanded upon that and made it a book in itself. And then when she switched directions and started including Harper Lee, I definitely wanted to know more. And then you got Tom Radney in there. I wanted to know more about that, too. Yes, well, she definitely has shown herself to be a very excellent researcher. And she was able to present all of that research in a very comprehensive way. I thought you could always add more detail, but I thought it was very comprehensive, very easy read. I, yeah. You know, for a true crime book without a whole lot of answers, it kept you really wanting to read more. Another question I thought of after the interview, I'm wondering what drew her to this book more? Was it Willie's dirty deeds or was it that Harper Lee was involved in it? You almost wonder, did one thing kind of lead to the other? Well, actually, in researching this, she says, she says that if she was working for the New Yorker, when Go Set a Watchman came out, she immediately was like, oh, I want to do a piece for the New Yorker. And she went to Alabama. And by researching Ah. that, she stumbled onto Reverend Willie Maxwell. There you go. Well, I've always been fascinated with Harper Lee. I like women who beat to their own drum. She definitely definitely did did that. (laughs) So if you're interested in Harper Lee and want to know how she spent her elder years, I just wish that book would have been published. (laughs) So next we have trivia. Last week's question was, John Buchan wrote The 39 Steps, but he was also known as A. 
the president of Wells Fargo, B, a candidate for president of the United States, C, the governor of Texas, or D, the Lord Tweedsmore? I'm going with Lord Tweedsmore, just because it's funny. (laughs) The answer is D, Lord Tweedsmore. His complete title was Lord Tweedsmore, His Excellency Right Honorable Lord Governor of Canada. Okay. This week's question, which mystery author was awarded? 